USA, Taiwan, Kazakhstan. It's a true nightmare that's happened for the first time in my whole life. Bulgaria. It was as if a bomb had fallen. Italy. Who could have known that the water would rush in so fast? We lost everything. Pakistan. Spain. China. Germany. Storms and hurricanes. Category 4 Hurricane Ian was the deadliest hurricane to hit Florida residents in the United States. Some cities were 90% destroyed by the storm surge, furious winds, and flooding. More than 1.5 million people had to leave their homes. According to preliminary estimates, the damage will exceed $100 billion. Fiona is the first Category 4 hurricane in history to move this far north. Fiona reached eastern Canada, maintaining the strength of Category 2 hurricane and left an unprecedented path of destruction in the country. In recent years, tropical storms have begun to move further north and south from the equator. The world's megacities such as New York, Boston, Beijing, and Tokyo could soon be under their attack. Typhoon Noru was predicted to hit the Philippines as the equivalent of Category 1 hurricane. But in just six hours, there was an explosive intensification to a Category 5 super typhoon with wind gusts reaching 196 miles per hour. People did not have time to prepare for the impact of the natural disaster of such force. More than 900,000 people were affected, while the damage to agriculture exceeded $52 million. In the United States, the number of convective storms, the damage of which exceeds $1 billion, is growing unprecedentedly. Between the year 2000 and 2010, there were 34 of them, and in the next 11 years, there were already 95. In the Southern Hemisphere, storm intensification over recent decades has already reached levels projected to occur in the year 2080. Abnormal precipitation and flooding. The number of abnormal precipitation events is growing all over the world. During the nine months of 2022, more than 35,000 daily records have been registered across the planet. Sudden floods leave no time for people to escape. The province of Ancona, Italy, was hit by half a year's worth of rain overnight. Never before in their lives had their residents seen such a rapid rise of water, almost one meter in 10 minutes. Australia has been hit by three waves of historic flood in 2022. Given such frequency and intensity of flooding, it makes no sense to rebuild some cities. In South Africa, almost a year's worth of rain fell within 24 hours, resulting in one of the deadliest floods in the 21st century in the country. Just 60 years ago, there were eight major floods per year in the world. And by 2021, this number has increased by 27 times. The monsoon season of 2022 turned into biggest climate disaster in modern history of Pakistan. One third of the country's provinces went underwater. More than 1,600 people have been killed and 33 million have been affected by the disaster. More than half of them are children. Over 2 million houses have been destroyed. Elderly people, pregnant women, and children are forced to live outdoors in inhumane conditions. There is a lack of food, drinking water, and medical care. Contaminated water has become a source of infections. People are left without jobs, shelter, and means of livelihood. After almost two months, the water is still not gone. The nightmare for people continues and will only get worse. Extreme heat and drought. During the nine month of 2022, they're having over 100,000 highest temperature records across the globe. In China, for the first time in world history, a heat wave reached 113 degrees Fahrenheit and lasted 79 days in a row. More than 900 million people were affected by extreme temperatures. Bomb shelters were open to people as a relief from the unbearable heat. In the European Union, the death of 53,000 people in July are directly attributed to the unprecedented heat wave. In 2022, severe droughts have hit many regions. Rivers and reservoirs have dried up. Shipping has been practically brought to halt. The energy crisis has worsened. Electricity bills have soared manyfold. The drought has destroyed crops, leading to unprecedented increase in food prices. The water crisis has reached record levels. Access to safe drinking water is under threat. No country, even an economically developed one, is immune to this problem. This year, over 2 billion people on our planet are already facing water shortages. Wildfires. In Russia, there has been a sharp increase in the total area of wildfires in the last five years. In 2022, 
Alaska is experiencing the largest wildfire season in its history. 50 years ago, there were no such thing as megafires, but as of early October 2022, there have already been 16 megafires in the USA alone, and many more are approaching that scale. In Europe, for the first time since satellite observations begin, the cumulative burnt area in 2022 so far exceeded 770,000 hectares, which is nearly three times the annual average. And in some countries, the increase in wildfires has been really shocking. In the Czech Republic, an average of nine hectares of land is burnt annually. However, by the end of September this year, the fire had already destroyed almost 1,500 hectares. This is 158 times more than the usual. Wildfires are not seasonal anymore. Now, they don't stop even in winter, and hurricane winds spread a fire at breakneck speed. In the Algerian province of Altaref, winds of over 55 miles per hour cause the flames to spread in a matter of minutes, leaving no chance for people to escape. Fires are occurring in places where they have almost never been before. Central Europe, the rainforest of South America, and even the Arctic are burning. What was predicted for the year 2100 is already happening right before our eyes today. In 2022, there has been an unprecedented leap in the power and the amount of natural disasters, and judging by the progression, they will continue to increase at record speed. In order for humankind to survive, urgent, extraordinary action is needed. Meanwhile, we have very little time left. In this short video, we have shown only a small part of the huge number of climate disasters that have occurred during nine months of this year. But even these examples show how abnormal and unpredictable the cataclysms have become and how significant their progression is. This year, people have seen with their own eyes just how intense the global climate crisis really has become. Today, everyone's doubts are gone. Many people are getting scared, but the absolutely scariest thing is what awaits us next, because the progression is increasing. And what's worse of all, no one has yet been able to offer a truthful, truly workable solution to the progressive climate disasters. In today's report, we will raise three key questions. First, what is the true cause of the escalating climate disasters? Second, what will happen next? Third, what is the solution? We've made accurate calculations, constructed mathematical models, and analytical forecast. As a result of our research, we have come to a very well-reasoned understanding that the cause of the climate change is not the increase in the anthropogenic CO2. The problem is not only that the temperature of the planet are currently rising, but there is also an increase in the number of anomalies deep in the planet's interior. Therefore, the reason for the increasing disasters is something else. Let's look at the facts of multiple thermal anomalies, which point to problems inside the planet. One of the signs of climate change that you are well aware of is the melting of glaciers. It is now well established that the glaciers of Antarctica and Greenland are melting from below. But what is the real threat behind this? Please look at the map in the middle. The red color here indicates the area where Antarctica has lost most of its ice since 2003. As you can clearly see on the map, this is only West Antarctica. Why is only West Antarctica melting from global warming? Geologists are well aware that West Antarctica is a relatively young continent with a thin crust. On the map to the left, you can see yellow and red areas showing the thin crust. The eastern part is represented with a thick, massive plate. On the right side of the tectonic map, you can see how West and East Antarctica differ. It is well known that Antarctica is also an active volcanic region. Today, more than 140 volcanoes have already been discovered under its ice. Take a closer look. Where are all these volcanoes? 
They are located exactly in West Antarctica, and most of them are located exactly where glaciers are melting. You may have heard that there are two glaciers in Antarctica that are melting the most. They are Pine Island and Thwaites. You can see them marked with red arrows on the map to the left. These glaciers are called Doomsday Glaciers. Multiple studies in recent years indicate that these that there is an increased heat flow beneath these glaciers from the subsurface. It comes from volcanoes located nearby. According to one research, the area beneath Pine Island is rising very quickly because the magma in the volcano under the glacier is hotter and more molten. This suggests a rapid rise of magma in this region. Please note, the intense melting of Antarctic glaciers began when it happened. That happened in 1995. Remember this year, today you will hear a lot about it. Since 1995, Antarctica's ice melt rate has increased by 65%. The question arises, why did the intensive melting of glaciers start exactly in our time? NASA seismologists have discovered a huge Maribyrg bird magma chamber under West Antarctica. The increased heat flow from the Earth's interior comes exactly from there and activates the volcanoes. In the diagram on the left, you can see this magma chamber in red. Despite the fact that the magma chamber has been there for millions of years, in 1995, for an inexplicable reason, it became active, which led to an increase in volcanic activity and intensive melting of the glaciers in West Antarctica. It is undeniable fact that Antarctica is melting from below due to the rise of magma within the magma chamber, and this has been happening since 1995. Right next to West Antarctica, is another heat anomaly area. Oceanographers from Germany have found that in the Weddell Sea off the coast of West Antarctica, at a depth of more than 2,000 meters, the water has warmed up five times faster than at the surface, whereas the upper 700 meters of water column has hardly heated at all. This is another fact showing that the heat is coming from below, from the depth. In the graph on the bottom right, you can see how significantly the temperature has been increasing since 1995. Just imagine how much heat it takes to warm the icy waters of the Antarctic Sea. The Weddell Sea is bounded on all sides by volcanic features that are currently showing anomalous activity. In the Bransfield Strait area is currently the most seismically active in the world. Look, it is marked on the map with a red arrow. Further in the report, you will hear more about the 85,000 earthquakes that occurred here within only six months in 2020. For comparison, before 1995, there were no more than 15,000 earthquakes per year around the entire Earth. This indicates that magma is reactively rising in the Bransfield Straits area, thus triggering earthquakes. It is only five kilometers away from breaking through. You see that the Weddell Sea, just like the entire West Antarctica, has also been heating up since 1995. And this is due to the rise of magma, the, its ascent, which is accompanied by an extreme increase in the number of earthquakes. You are smart people, and you understand perfectly well that humans cannot influence seismic activity at the bottom of the ocean in any way, all the more so in Antarctica. You will be surprised, but similar processes are taking place now in the central part of Greenland. So where does the in increase in heat flow under Greenland come from? Let's take a look at the video. Equally intense ice melting is also taking place on another part of the planet, in Greenland. Research conducted in October 2020 showed that Greenland's ice is now melting faster than ever before in the past 12,000 years. In 2019 alone, Greenland's ice sheet lost the most ice in recorded history, 600 billion tons. It is also surprising that giant lakes appear under the surface of the glacier which is actually 1.5 kilometers thick. As of today, 
we already know about six dozen subglacial lakes of Greenland. The temperature of the ice surrounding them is around minus 28 degrees Celsius. But these lakes do not freeze. Why? Several research groups of scientists joined in the effort to find an answer to this very question. They discovered the fact that under Greenland, just as under Antarctica, there is a mantle bloom. Geothermal flows coming from its bowels cause formation of subglacial lakes and melting of glaciers. Using gravitational research, a team of American scientists led by Professor Ralph von Friese estimated the thickness of Greenland's crust. Active melting of glaciers has been observed in the northern part of the island where the crust is thinner and an increased geothermal flow due to the rising mantle bloom has been detected. Using seismic tomography data, scientists from an interdisciplinary team at the Schmidt Institute of Physics of the Earth saw that the flow of magma rises from the center of the core to the Earth's surface right beneath the central part of Greenland. This is where the largest number of subglacial lakes are located. The scientists have calculated the theoretical heat flux corresponding to this magma chamber and found that this heat is sufficient to warm the base of the glacier up to the melting point of the ice. These same results have been confirmed by similar studies using machine learning technology. Now you know that the increased melting of Greenland is also due to the rise of magma in the magma chamber. The glaciers of Antarctica and Greenland have begun to melt from below since 1995. And this is happening faster than at any time in the past 12,000 years. This suggests that there hasn't been such an intense rise in magma over the period of 12,000 years. But as it turned out, exactly this period of 12,000 years is of enormous importance. Next, you will learn why magma in magma chambers have begun to behave so strangely, how this threatens humankind and when it will happen. Apart from melting of glaciers, the oceans are also showing significant thermal anomalies. Let's have a look at where this is happening. The ocean is the source of life for the entire planet and for us humans. But it ceases to be the source of life. It is about to become the source of our death. Just think about it. Ocean warming has increased by 450% in just 30 years. According to scientific estimations, for the ocean to heat up at today's rate, it would take as much energy as would be released if seven atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima would explode every second for a year. The direst fact is that the ocean is heating not only on the surface, but also at depth. A team of U.S. researchers has found that the average depths of the ocean warmed 15 times faster over the past 60 years than they had been warming over the previous 10,000 years. And this progression is accelerating every year. At the moment, science has no explanation where this amount of heat comes from. The only theories being considered are that the oceans are warming from the sun and from human emissions of the greenhouse gas CO2 but they can only explain heating of the upper layers of the ocean to a depth of up to 200 meters, because sun rays do not penetrate deeper. The water can be maximally heated by the sun up to 700 meters as a result of agitation. How can we explain the numerous facts of warming of the deep ocean layers? Think about it. How much energy does it take to heat such a volume of water as the world's oceans? We already see examples of such anomalous heating everywhere, not only on the bottom, but also on the surface. At the end of 2013, a huge area of unusually warm ocean water, about one-third the size of the United States, formed in the Gulf of Alaska and it began to spread. The water temperature in many places exceeded the norm by five to six degrees Celsius. National Geographic dubbed it the blob that cooked the Pacific. Nick Bond, state climatologist for Washington, named this phenomenon the blob. The appearance of such anomalies began to suddenly become more frequent. There is something common that unites the places of formation of all these blobs. 
These are geologically active regions with a young, thin crust, with active underwater volcanoes, cracks, and deep crustal fractures. These are places of the most active output of hot and fluid magma. The ocean is called the Kitchen of Weather. The warming of its waters already enhances catastrophic typhoons and hurricanes, which annually claim thousands of human lives. The unprecedented heating of the ocean suggests that the ocean is already exhausting its ability to contain the energy trying to escape from the bowels of the Earth. And when magma reaches the denser and thicker rocks of the continental crust, which on average is two to three times thicker than the oceanic crust, then the processes of cascading eruptions of land volcanoes will begin. And it will be too late to stop this process or to seek salvation. As we can see, the ocean is warming at the seafloor, not only in the Weddell Sea, but also all over the world. Even the mid-death are warming, while the huge volumes of heated water, the so-called blobs, are rising to the surface. Note that such blobs of hot water have been appearing more and more frequently since 1995. Look at the bottom right graph. Obviously, no human emissions are capable of heating up the ocean as much as 5 to 7 degrees Celsius over such short period of time, all the more so only in local areas. In light of this, the theory that anthropogenic emissions warm the oceans sounds ridiculous. The ocean is a huge reservoir of CO2, with 95% of planet's CO2 dissolved in it. As the ocean gets cooler, its water absorbs CO2. And accordingly, the warmer the ocean gets, the more CO2 it releases into the atmosphere. Now, you and I already know that the ocean is heated by magma from the Earth's interior. So there it is, the reason for the increase in the CO2 in the atmosphere. It is the heating of the ocean that causes the increase of CO2 levels, not the other way around. This is nothing to do with humans. The increase of CO2 is only a consequence of the processes taking place in the interior of the planet. As you can see, these facts indicate that our entire current climate agenda to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere is a waste of time and money, including yours. It raises the question, who is working on addressing the actual causes then? Arthur Viterito, who is a professor at the Maryland Institute, also pointed out that since 1995, various ocean and atmospheric parameters have begun changing. Since 1995, atmospheric humidity begins to increase, which is due to the heating of the ocean from beneath. Take a look. The changes in 1995 are marked in the graphs with red arrows. Professor Arthur Viterito discovered that in 1995, seismic activity began to increase at an unprecedented rate along the boundaries of thin oceanic plates in the mid-oceans. Look at the map to the right showing the increase in this, in this activity, and the red arrow, arrow on the graph indicates a spike in earthquakes in 1995. Intermediate conclusions. Now, since 1995, there has been an intense ascent of magma. This results in first, increased melting of the glaciers of West Antarctica and Greenland from the bottom up. Second, warming of the Weddell Sea. Third, an increase in the number of thermal anomalies in the ocean. Fourth, increased seismic activity along the plate boundaries in the ocean. Next, you will hear about even more anomalous processes in the interior of our planet, which started in 1995.
The ascent of magma has resulted in an unprecedented increase in the number of earthquakes. Earthquakes usually occur at the depth of 5 to 80 kilometers, where the crust is more brittle and has cracks. But the last decade has seen an increase in the number of earthquakes at the, at the depth where it had been previously considered impossible. These are the depths of more than 700 kilometers, where earthquakes are not supposed to occur because the rocks in the inner mantle are plastic, like molten clay, and they are unable to crack. Over the recent seven years, the number of deep focus earthquakes has increased by a factor of 10. Remember this. So why do earthquakes occur at such depths where they have never occurred before? You will learn about this later in the report. The highest number of deep focus earthquakes is observed in the area where the Hanga Tanga Hanga Haapai volcano erupted in January 2022. Look, it is marked with a red arrow on the map. And the worst part is that it is just outside the Mariana Trench, where which has the thinnest oceanic crust, a mere five kilometers. This is an important fact. Please take a note of it as well. Seismic activity is increasing both on the ocean floor and on land. Earthquakes are emerging even in regions where they have never been before. The number of earthquakes, their magnitude and energy are increasing. And please note that in 1995, the first distinct rate rise in the growth of earthquakes took place. Look at the map in front of you. It depicts earthquakes before and after 1995. You can see the fact that earthquakes began to expand away from the edges of the plates and occur in new territories. It is important to note that the reported growth of seismic activity over the past 30 years has nothing to do with the number of seismic sensors on the planet. Please take a look at the graph. The black dots conti um, continuously show the events that started to be registered around the planet, which indicates that the observation network is very dense. By 1973, the number of installed seismic stations around the world had already been sufficient to record all earthquakes of magnitude 4 and greater, regardless of where they occurred. Let's see what this means for all of us, people. Earthquakes and volcanoes. The power of the Earth's interior manifests itself unpredictably on the surface, causing colossal damage and destroying all life around. In the recent years, these emissions of planetary energy have been growing exponentially in gigantic leaps. Something inexplicable has started to happen. In 2015, a record-breaking earthquake was registered near Japan at a depth of 751 kilometers. This had never been seen before, and indeed was considered impossible by the scientific community. Earthquakes were thought to occur only in the Earth's crust and upper mantle when blocks of lithospheric plates break and shift. At great depths, matter is more malleable and does not behave like brittle glass, but rather like plasticine. There is nothing breakable there, but earthquakes do happen, and that is a fact. The horrible part is that their number and magnitude are increasing. Earthquakes are not only becoming deeper, but they are also getting closer to the surface, which means they are becoming more destructive. Today, more and more of them are concentrated at a depth of about 10 kilometers. For example, an entire series of 36 seismic events of significant magnitude from 4.5 to 7.0 occurred near New Caledonia in early April 2022. Just one earthquake of similar magnitude and depth in August 2021 in Haiti caused fatal damage and killed more than 2,200 people. 
The deadly threat is increasingly rising to the surface of the Earth. Right before our eyes, cracks are appearing and faults are being activated. The ground is literally crumbling beneath our feet, swallowing whole houses. Faults have been activated in the USA, Kenya, Iceland, Turkey, China, Lake Bacal, and other regions. Each of them can cause enormous damage. It is an abyss opening underfoot. The number of observed earthquake swarms, that is, of clusters of rhythmic shocks, is increasing on the planet. A swarm is characterized by almost similar magnitudes of seismic events that occur at short intervals in a local area. The number of seismic events in individual earthquake swarms has increased from a few or few dozens to hundreds and sometimes thousands. Their magnitude and duration have increased. This is due to the intrusion of magma and hot gases into the microcracks of rocks. Swarms are now being recorded not only in fault zones and near volcanoes, but also in more quiet regions. The Palgar region of India, located in a quiet continental region, began swarming with earthquakes in September 2018 and continues to this day. In just two years, about 5,000 earthquakes of a magnitude up to 3.8 occurred within a small area. And what has been happening since August 2020 in the Bronzefield Strait off of Antarctica has been described by scientists as a huge magma intrusion. Some 85,000 earthquakes have been detected in the first six months with a maximum magnitude of six. Normally, these processes occur over geologic timescales as opposed to over the course of a human lifespan, said study co-author Simone Cheska, seismologist at the Research Center in Potsdam. Magma is literally devouring the lithospheric plate from the inside, having traveled two-thirds of the way to the surface in six months. Only five kilometers of rock remain before a catastrophic rupture occurs. And that is just one example. Similar things are happening everywhere. The way the seismic activity is rapidly increasing these days is a catastrophe. But the most absurd thing is that these seismic agencies, international seismic databases, are now trying to conceal the fact that the number and magnitude of earthquakes is increasing. Until 2014, earthquake trends for major international databases were the same. And now, watch closely. Look at the graph. How did the curves start to behave after 2014? We see a complete diff complete discrepancy in the data from different seismic databases. What happened? The graph shows the total number of all unique earthquakes from different databases. You can see from colored bars that until 2014, the databases registered the same set of earthquakes. But since 2015, they've started registering different set of earthquakes, chaotically, regardless of the region. Simply, they began to put all events into different baskets. Scientists use particular database relying on its validity. And as a result, they see no real increase in seismic activity and rely on incomplete data in their studies. The largest correction was made to the records of seismic events with magnitudes from three to four. Look, in the graph to the left, you can see that a chunk of data for small magnitude earthquake is missing. Can you believe that Indonesia, one of the most seismically active regions, has stopped having small magnitude earthquakes? Their number has dropped from 3,500 to 8. Why the small ones? Because they most clearly reflect the process of magma ascent. Their numbers 
are the first to increase. And there are many more such examples of data distortion and underreporting of magnitudes. In reality, there are much stronger earthquakes taking place now than we're told. The real increase in seismic activity on the planet looks like this. You can download the seismic data yourselves and verify our information. And you too will see the scam taking place. We don't judge them. We understand that they resort to such methods because they see no way out and don't want to sow panic among people. But can we call those who do this true scientists? Manipulation of information occurs not only with scientific data, but also in the media. Two opposing theories of climate change can be found today. The first is that the climate is changing as a result of anthropogenic CO2 emissions, and the second is that the climate is not changing at all. There are mass media outlets that support one or another theory by promoting it. But the truth is that both theories are sponsored by the same sources, whereas the media, in both cases, are owned by the same masters. We're supposedly given a choice, given two hypotheses, but they are equally irrelevant to reality. There is a mass mind manipulation going on at the time when we should have been ringing the alarm bell a long time ago. This can associatively be compared to a burning city, Imagine, you and I are living in a city where a fire has started. The homes on the outskirts of our city are on fire. We worry and ask the question, what's going on? And we are immediately offered different answers to choose from. Some say, it's not a fire at all, it's hallucination, a fantasy, nothing will come to you, it's just a glam, a sunset, don't worry. Others say, it's just boys running around with flashlights. Yet the others say, it's a herd of cows and their reflections are coloring the sky. There are no fires, live peacefully, sleep and have a good rest. Meanwhile, some others actively invite us, look, there are men fighting for money, look, or what a beautiful speech the governor of our city delivers, hurry up and listen. We, the residents of the city, see and hear all this, and what are we supposed to do? We see that our neighbors' homes are already on fire, and by all laws, our will burn next. So what should we do? Should we tell them, sleep well, your home will burn down, not today, but tomorrow, so there is no need to panic until tomorrow, you shouldn't be nervous? Or should we wake our neighbors up as soon as possible? Yes, he will wake up and be frightened, but emotions and hormones in him will activate, which will add strength to his muscles to go and get water in buckets and to quickly put out the fire of neighboring homes before the own gets burned. Isn't that what we are supposed to do if we want to save our home or else we will definitely burn down? Are we going to keep quiet or to put out the fire? Enough of lies. It's time to put out the fire. Of course, we'll go get the buckets and run to put out the fire while, while we can. Otherwise, tomorrow, all of the homes will burn down along with us. We must act because we are the ones who can put put it out, you know, there's no one but us. In this example, putting out the fire is all about informing humanity about the real climate situation on the planet. The media and those who own them are not going to, to do this because they have no solution to the situation. In order to maintain calmness and stability in the masses and prevent panic, they're forced to lie to us. In actual fact, there is a way out of the climate collapse, but in order to do so, everyone must wake up, learn about the ongoing and coming events and start taking action. People need to know the truth. truth. Further in the report, we will reveal step by step what will happen to the climate, when it will happen, what it will lead to, and most importantly, what the way out of the situation for the entire humanity is. Let's go back to the processes inside a planet. What has been happening on the planet since 1995? This year, a series of unprecedented changes began to occur in the magnetic field of the planet. The magnetic North Pole begins to drip rapidly at a rate 
four times the normal. At the same time, the magnetic field weakens 10 times faster than before. Weakening of the magnetic field is already affecting even the upper layers of the atmosphere, thus reducing their density and cooling them down. But that's not all of it. In 1995, simultaneously with the shift of the magnetic pole, the rotation axis of the planet sharply changed direction and began to move 17 times faster than before. Rotation axis of the planet started to change its trajectory. Look at the graph to the right. The blue circle here represents rotation axis as it used to be before 1995. The orange circles indicate the new trajectory, which shows that the rotation axis of the Earth is shifting sideways. Meanwhile, since 1995, one of the stages of unprecedented acceleration of the planet's rotation has been observed. The acceleration occurs in leaps and bounds. The planet accelerates abruptly, then slows down a little, however, with each subsequent stage it accelerates even more. Take a look at the yellow lines in the graph. These are the trend lines indicating the rate at which the length of the day is shortening. For example, the left line is flatter, whereas the right line showing the acceleration starting from 2016 is on almost vertical, which means that the length of the day is shortening many times faster. What does it mean? That our planet is spinning up drastically, like a spinning top, and it's getting faster every time. So what are the causes of the changes in the magnetic field? Field, the trajectory of the planet's axis of rotation and the speed of rotation that began in 1995. Few people know about the real nuclear threat. The real nuclear threat is the, is the nucleus that is the core of our planet. The core of our planet is the entire system that synchronizes and stabilizes all processes on Earth and plays pivotal role in climate changes happening right now on our planet. Why? Because the rotation of the core forms the electromagnetic field and gravity, protects the atmosphere and thus preserves the conditions for life on Earth. For a long time, the rotation of the core remained unchanged, but a few decades ago the situation changed radically. All that you and I already know about the anomalies in the magnetic field and the Earth's rotation suggests that there has been a malfunction in the core itself, and this is a catastrophe. So what is happening to our planet's core? Let's watch a video. Another important evidence confirming that abnormal processes are taking place in the core is the drastic acceleration of the North Magnetic Pole's drift by 3.5 times over the past 20 years. Together with the extreme acceleration of the North Magnetic Pole movement, a mysterious anomaly weakens the planetary magnetic field, which protects us from dangerous galactic and solar radiation. Scientists have been able to calculate that the Earth's magnetic field has weakened by 9% over the past 200 years. As a result, an area of weak magnetic field known as the South Atlantic Anomaly has been formed between Africa and South America. Moreover, in the last five years, another such area has developed southwest of Africa, and it is actively growing. The electromagnetic field is generated by the dynamo mechanism in the Earth's core, and therefore it is evident that changes in the magnetic field indicate changes in the core. Another proof of the anomalous behavior of the Earth's core is the appearance of a powerful neutrino emission from the bowels of the Earth, which was also registered in the year 2015. An even more anomalous event occurred in the year 1998. Scientists detected a sharp bouncing displacement of the core by observing the Earth's center of mass using satellites. As a result of the bounce, the core shifted sharply northward toward the Tamir Peninsula. 
At this time, scientists at the Medicina station in Italy detected a gravity burst. The velocity of the planet also increased as well as the centrifugal force. Concurrently, there was a dramatic change in the shape of the Earth. As measured by a laser rangefinder system from the US satellites, the planet began to expand abnormally along the equator, whereas before that, the trend had been the opposite. Because of the increased centrifugal force, magma plumes began to rise closer to the surface, which increased the geothermal heat flow and the number of earthquakes. As a result, new faults and cracks began to form, through which water from the surface began to escape deep into the Earth. In the same year, there was a sharp increase in the speed of the North Magnetic Pole's drift. The bounce of the Earth's center of mass became the key factor of the system's imbalance. This event led to a dissonance among all the Earth's shelves, which caused a dramatic increase in many natural disasters. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, and so on. It is worth noting that during the same period, there was also synchronous bouncing changes in natural processes on the Sun, Moon, Mars, and other celestial bodies of the solar system. And this also occurred because of the displacement of their cores. This has led scientists to believe that such synchronous bounces may be caused by the influence of external factors on the solar system. But over the past 50 years, our planet has continued to accelerate. Since the year 2016, this trend has intensified even more. July 19, 2020, was recorded as the shortest day in the history of observations. Even seemingly insignificant acceleration of the huge mass of the Earth will cause catastrophic consequences in the near future. Let's make brief conclusions from the video. As you understand, in 1995, irreversible destructive processes began to occur in the core of our planet. This can be seen from the change in the magnetic field. And as a consequence, in 1998, there was a leap which exacerbated all the processes many times over. As a result of the, the core of the Earth shifted abruptly northward towards Siberia. We are now observing a complete destabilization of the core. And it is important to understand that the shift of the core affects the motion of magma in the interior of the planet. Look at the trajectory of the core shift in 1998. The bouncing of the core caused two ascending waves of magma from the Earth's interior in opposite directions. One flow of magma traveled toward West Antarctica and the other one tra traveled toward Siberia. What is happening in Siberia right now? Something that has never happened there before. It is in Siberia at northern latitudes a number of extremely anomalous phenomena have been registered over the past few decades. Melting permafrost from below, fires under, under the snow and boiling water in wells. Moreover, for 20 years now, scientists have been observing that Siberia is heating up three to four times faster than the rest of the world. I emphasize three, four times faster than the rest of the world. Look at the map. The huge red stain shows how the average temperature in Siberia is changing faster than in the rest of the world in recent decades. As magma rises, it begins to heat the plate from below and boils the groundwater. But magma is rising not only in Siberia and West Antarctica. Where else is magma rising and what does it lead to? Let's take a look at this video. In recent decades, the Earth has been accelerating its rotation by leaps and bounds, which means the centrifugal force is increasing. As a result, at the equator, the planet is expanding and increasing in volume. 
This causes the Earth's crust to crack and geological faults to activate. At this time, processes similar to blood cavitation occur in the Earth's interior with magma. Blood cavitation during Kaisen disease is a life-threatening phenomenon known to divers during rapid ascent to the surface. Due to the sudden drop of pressure, the dissolved gases in the blood are released instantly, causing the blood to boil. The resulting gas bubbles destroy the walls of the blood vessels. In the Earth's interior, sudden pressure drops are associated with an instantaneous increase in centrifugal forces during a sudden acceleration of the planet's rotation. This causes magma to rush abruptly towards the Earth's surface. Lithospheric plates are destroyed by cavitation, microbursts of active gas saturated magma. Just as the walls of vessels are fused by the bubbled blood of a diver, this process accelerates itself, affecting deeper and deeper layers of the mantle. That is why we are seeing ever more powerful and deep earthquakes and seismic swarms. The proof that this process is increasing and accelerating can be seen in the massive double deep earthquake in Peru. Meanwhile, the expansion and intensification of the pressure on the crust due to the cavitation of the magma serves to intensify the erosion process. What does that mean for us? Soon, we will see eruptions and earthquakes of a magnitude that our civilization has never experienced before. The countdown of the clockwork mechanism of the magma bomb inside our planet has already started. Under the onslaught of a massive attack from the Earth's interior, the thinner oceanic crust is already giving up its position. The ocean has so far restrained this power, but eruptions are moving into the terrestrial phase. Tonga is vivid proof of this. It has the highest number of deep focus earthquakes and the eruption of the Hunga Tonga, Hunga Hapai, volcano on 15 January 2022 alone affected 80% of the population of the surrounding region. If one volcano can do that, what can we expect from a massive eruption of terrestrial volcanoes? After all, already now, we observe their synchronization. The thicker continental crust is holding the line for now, but it won't last long. This threatens to bring on a volcanic winter and a new ice age. The magma's violent power has already awakened volcanoes that have been dormant for hundreds and thousands of years. Our planet is looking more and more like a minefield, where shells are beginning to detonate like a chain reaction. But an even greater threat is fraught with those volcanoes that have not yet woken up. Giants such as Yellowstone, Campi Flagre, Elbrus, Lach, Kikai are called doomsday volcanoes because the eruption of any of them could lead to the extinction of all life on Earth. They have held back the power of the Earth's interior for a millennia, but now they are showing signs of activation. When the magma beneath these volcanoes reaches a critical point, the scale of the catastrophe is hard to imagine. Our planet is splitting apart, yet we are busy with something else. Endless problems of the consumerist format cover our eyes, not allowing us to see the main thing. We are deceived by data manipulation. Earthquake statistics are manipulated in the same way that temperature data is. Those who do this keep quiet, some for the money and some, perhaps, not to scare people and spread panic so that people live out their last days in peace. Because it was so suffocating inside, I couldn't breathe. People die inside the, I mean the dead body inside the house. It's a nightmare. Well, I'm pretty well fucked. Uh, I fell through that hole. So that we go straight to the precipice with our eyes closed while someone knows 
but deliberately hides or is afraid to voice the truth. Now we can see that magma ascent is happening all over the world. Because the core is shifting, centrifugal forces are accelerating and the bounces of the core start to push out magma abruptly. The faster the planet spins, the harder it pushes liquid magma away from the core towards the surface. This happens according to the principle of centrifuge. And this is not happening for millions of years. This is happening right now. Recall how quickly quickly magma came toward the surface near Antarctica. In a recent magma study of the Fagradalsfjall volcano in Iceland, which erupted in March 2021, showed that the new magma is coming from deep layers of a single mantle plume under both Iceland and Greenland. Because of this, Iceland is experiencing swarms of earthquakes, 1,000 events Per day, and volcanoes that have not been active for thousands of years have begun to erupt. That is, the deeper layers of magma are rising as a result of mixing. It is as if someone's stirring the stew inside our planet with a huge teaspoon. As it rises, the pressure in the magma drops, causing it to boil like blood during cavitation. Because of this, magma expands in volume and begins to press, erode, and heat the earth crust more. Remember, we have already talked about unprecedented increase in the number of earthquakes depth of more than 700 kilometers. And here is the answer to what deep focus earthquake and liquid magma are. This is exactly boiling of magma and cavitation explosions. Think about it. Explosions, equivalent to thousands of nuclear bombs in power, have just started to occur interior of our planet. The increased pressure of magma melts and deforms the Earth's crust. This causes new cracks to appear in the crust through which water escapes. And the magma is rising everywhere right now. Where the thrust is thin, it is being felt the most. As we know, both West Siberia and West Antarctica have very thin crust. But look at the map. Yellow and red colors show regions where the crusts are also thin. This includes Europe, West Coast of the United States, Africa, Australia, China, and many other regions. The ascent of magma triggers volcanic eruptions. One of the most famous supervolcanoes, Yellowstone, is showing alarming signs of seismic activity. The number of earthquake swarms is increasing there. The map shows where the ground rises and sinks near the caldera. The magma there is critically close to the crust and any slightest destabilization in the planet's interior will cause an eruption of Yellowstone. And this means a catastrophe not only for the USA, but for all humankind. Supervolcanoes will undoubtedly react when the magma gets closer. The motion of the planet's core increases the pressure in the magma. And when the pressure reaches a critical point, the magma will burst out in the form of exploding volcanoes. Помните. Do you remember we've mentioned the Mariana Trench, where the oceanic crust is the thinnest, only five kilometers, and where the most deep-focused volcanoes take place? In other words, the largest amount of cavitation blasts of magma occurs. And more terrifying than the Yellowstone explosion is a forecast of a magnitude 10 earthquake near the Mariana Trench. Such powerful earthquakes have never happened within the memory of our civilization. This means that the magma will easily tear through the 5-kilometer crust. Later in the report, you will learn about the consequences of the magma breakout in the Mariana Trench. What are the reasons for this instability of the Earth's core and acceleration of the planet? What is pushing the magma to the outside? 
A detailed analysis of geologic data has shown that similar catas catastrophic changes already took place on our planet 12,000 years ago. Changes similar to what we now see occurred before the peak of the crushing disaster just about 12,000 years ago. Those events are called the Alared Oscillation and the Younger Dryas glaciation that followed. 12,800 years ago, global temperatures rose as much as 15 degrees Celsius within just a few years. Most of the ice sheet suddenly melted and the earth emerged from a full ice age. At that time, there were extreme floods and other natural disasters along with an intense sea level rise. The Gulf Stream stopped at that time, just as it is happening nowadays. Scientists from the University of Kansas have proven that about 12,800 years ago, there was a giant fire on Earth that covered a tenth of the entire planet's surface. Other researchers have also found that large fires raged in Siberia 12,000 years ago. Similarly, nowadays there are more and more large-scale fires that cannot be extinguished. Based on an analysis of satellite images, scientists have discovered that 10 to 13,000 years ago the largest known dunes formed in the Sahara Desert and other regions, indicating the enormous strength of winds during the Younger Dryas. A short-term intensification of winds during that period has also been documented from Greenland Ice Cores data and research in Alaska. Nowadays, the same phenomena are happening on Earth as during the Younger Dryas. We see winds, hurricanes, typhoons, and tornadoes intensifying and destroying entire cities, raising them to the ground. Right at the cycle change 12,000 years ago, there was a very intensive seismic activity. This is indicated by radiocarbon data, as well as paleographic reconstructions of the Younger Dryas. During the same time period, more than 12,000 years ago, as well as now, there was a drastic weakening of the magnetic field and a pole shift, which was called the Gothenburg Excursion. The reason for all these abrupt changes was an abnormal magmatic activity caused by changes in the core. This was expressed in large-scale volcanic eruptions that scientists recorded in the Younger Dryas by dust and traces of acid rains and glacial cores. Analysis of sediments found in Hall's cave points to volcanic eruptions that caused a volcanic winter about 13,000 years ago and glaciation across the globe. After the sudden warming in the Younger Dryas, an equally abrupt cooling occurred. This event caused a mass extinction of megafauna. Thousands of frozen mammoths and other mammals were found in the ice on the northern slopes of Siberia there happened a drastic decline in the human population, including extinction of the Cro-Magnon. All of those catastrophic events occurred within just a few decades. As you can see, in the Younger Dryas, changes in the magnetic field began, exactly the ones happening now. Then there were catastrophic eruptions on the planet as a result of the magma ascent. During this period, 90% of the megafauna went extinct. There was a demographic, demographic catastrophe and humanity shrinked to 140,000 people. However, this time it will be much worse, and soon you will find out why. After analyzing the geologic data for the past 100,000 years, we have noticed that abrupt magnetic pole shifts occur with a certain periodicity. Have a look at the graph. You can see the time intervals when these pole shifts occurred. This happens approximately every 12 13,000 years. According to the geological evidence, during these periods there was also a weakening of the magnetic field by 8-10 times. Let's recall that the same thing is happening today. Our magnetic field is weakening 10 times faster than it was in the last century. You and I already know that 
changes in the magnetic field do not occur by themselves. This is a result of changes in the planet's core. Thus, we see that every 12,000 years, for some reason, the motion of the Earth's core changes abruptly. And all this happens due to the fact that there is something that cyclically causes sudden disturbances in the functioning of the core. Also, according to studies of ice cores, every 12,000 years there was an abnormal increase in volcanic activity. We already know that this is caused by the ascent of magma closer to the Earth's crust. In the graph, you can see when such eruptions occurred. The size of the circles reflects the size of the eruptions. Take note of the big red circles. They indicate that every 24,000 years, volcanic eruptions are more catastrophic. Such supervolcano eruptions wiped out almost all life on the planet. Archaeological evidence suggests that every time during these catastrophic eruptions, entire species of Homo sapiens almost died out. Taupo volcano in New Zealand erupted 24,000 years ago, and Albrus erupted 48,000 years ago. Both of these volcanoes are already showing signs of abnormal activity these days. Last month alone, 700 earthquakes occurred in the area of Taupo. And 72 to 74,000 years ago, there was an eruption of the Tobo volcano. It was one of the largest eruptions on, on Earth over the past 25 million years. Archaeologists believe that only 2 to 10 thousand people survived this catastrophe across the entire planet, which means that humankind was one step away from extinction. It is important to note that every 12,000 years, the climate changes dramatically and average temperatures on the planet spike by 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. This is followed by catastrophic floods and natural disasters. Look at the graph. It shows that every 12,000 years, there is a sharp temperature spike. It is important to note that according to the ice core data, each time during the cycle, the CO2 concentration increases due to ocean heating. The same thing is happening now. In the papers that were written before 1985, it is said that CO2 concentrations in the previous cycles might have been five to 10 times higher than they are now. But after the IPCC experts convened, that data began to mysteriously disappear from the papers. CO2 is rising indeed, but it has nothing to do with human activity nowadays, just as it had nothing to do with it in the previous times. Just as in the previous times, temperature changes have occurred without human involvement. We're not against CO2. We know that the anthropogenic factor affects the climate by 1% only. But friends, we're not talking about how 1% of carbon dioxide affects everything else. We're talking about how we can survive, because we have a huge problem in front of us. This could be compared to worrying that the paint on the car door handle is spilling and spoiling the look of the car, whereas something started rattling in the engine, and we don't know when it's going to break. But according to our calculations, it's going to happen soon. We've calculated very carefully the progression model that we're going to present to you because it's in our human interests. We're now seeing a critical increase in climate disasters on Earth. That said, we know that the last time such changes in the core occurred was 12,000 years ago. The red arrow marks our time. As you can see, we are 12,000 years ahead from the previous peak. Facts and dates are very stubborn things. So unfortunately, we are forced to state that we are just in the next such cycle. 
a 12,000 year cycle of climatic catastrophes, which is overlapped by a more catastrophic 24,000 year cycle. So unfortunately, the worst case scenario awaits us. We can see that magma pressure is already building up. What does that tell you? You are smart people. You're making, you're great at making predictions based on the facts. This suggests that the climate changes and natural disasters that we're seeing on Earth today are only the beginning, not yet the disaster. In fact, the real disaster is ahead. And according to our mathematical model, it is very, very close. Taking the progression into account, we have calculated how the 24 year thousand cycle unfolded. And by analyzing the way things are developing now, we have calculated the phases when it's going to peak and how it's going to end. You will hear about that next. But what causes the cycle of cataclysms and affects the core of our planet every 12,000 years? Let's watch a video. Researchers believe that this cyclicity is galactic in nature, that is, it is related to the rotation cycle of the galaxy. Every 12,000 years, radiation from the center of the universe affects the solar system and even influences the sun. In 1998, not only was the Earth's core recorded jumping, but also those of the moon, the sun, and other planets. In recent decades, scientists began to record drastic climate changes on all planets and satellites of the solar system. An increase in the number of giant storms and hurricanes, abnormal temperatures, an increase in volcanic and seismic activity. Now, an increased flux of cosmic radiation due to the low activity of the sun is detected on Earth. Scientists have found evidence that a similar bombardment by cosmic rays occurred 12,500 years ago. In addition, every 12,000 years, an unknown flow of violent cosmic energy from the center of the universe comes to our planet. This high energy impact occurs at the micro level and has enormous potential to trigger a shift of the planet's core. Galactic radiation disrupts the life cycles of the biosphere. Trees begin to massively emit more carbon dioxide, whereas swamps emit compounds of deadly gases. This time, Earth may become another dead planet, just like Mars. The planet's immune system is now destroyed by the toxins that our technogenic civilization has excreted. The planet's diseased organism might not survive the enormous stresses which cyclicity creates every 12,000 years. Every 24,000 years, disasters are even more devastating since the solar system gets closer to the radiation from the center of the universe. We are now getting into this point of the near interaction. The planet is living its last years. And so are we, if we remain idle. As you have seen in the video, dramatic climate changes are now occurring on other planets in the solar system as well. That is, the cause of climate change is certain external influence, a higher energy radiation, which is clearly coming from the outer space. This is evidenced by the fact that similar processes are being observed on all planets of the solar system. Let's draw intermediate conclusions. We are entering a more dangerous, cataclysmic cycle of 24,000 years. At the same time, the planet's environment is killed and the planet's immunity is weakened. Moreover, we have not even entered the peak of the cycle yet. Disasters and cataclysms are already escalating at an alarming rate. In this case, underground bunkers will not help. They will simply melt down because magma is rising from below. And now the key question of our report, how much time is left before the catastrophe of our cycle happens? Please take a look at the seismic activity graph again. 
you clearly see a geometric progression. This progression has a mathematical pattern. So having calculated it together with the best scientists, geologists, and analysts, we have modeled the progression in which earthquakes will accelerate in the future. And what we have discovered was utterly ter terrifying. Why? Take a look yourself. As you can see, the rate of increase in seismic activity is shocking. At each successive stage, the number of earthquakes increases three times as much. If your income as entrepreneurs grew at this progression, you would be the most successful business people. But unfortunately, this is the progression of our common end. The more earthquakes occur, the more their magnitude will increase. And by 2028, there will be 1,000 destructive earthquakes a day on Earth, whereas in 2036, there will be over a million earthquakes a year. Just think about it, more than a million earthquakes a year. What is this, if not our end? Already in 2028, life will be almost unbearable. That's literally in six years. Just think, your comfortable family life, your business, your plans will be over in six years. And in 2036, the end of all humanity will come. Our economists from various countries have calculated how this progression of cataclysms will affect the world economy. You see the graph of that progression here. The dynamics are obvious. It suggests that the collapse of the global economic system will happen as early as 2030. Already in 2030, the world's GDP will not be able to cover all the losses from the climate. In fact, the business worldwide has no more than six to seven years left. And from here on, the processes will worsen even, critically, even more critically. Why? We now arrive at a very sad conclusion. If we had lived in a 12,000 year cycle, we would have lived through this as a civilization and continued our existence, albeit with great losses. But we are in 24,000 year cycle. Considering how our planet endured it before, it was complete devastation. Super volcanoes exploded and most of life was simply swept away. And our mathematical model, which takes into account comprehensive data of how the processes of climate change happened before and how they're happening now, gives us an understanding that the Earth is following in the footsteps of Mars. We've calculated different variants of events development and came to conclusion that in any event, the mildest variants of the current cycle, all humanity will die. And according to our mathematical model, this will happen no later than 2036. Yes, we are already experiencing bad times. There is an economic crisis, geopolitical crisis, and many regions of the planet are truly on the brink of starvation. Large-scale cataclysms are underway, scorching droughts in some places, terrible floods in others, hurricanes, tsunamis, and earthquakes. But just imagine what will happen when the planet is almost devoid of livable places due to earthquakes when the largest portion of the budget of all countries will be spent on covering losses from disasters. Of course, living conditions will critically deteriorate. Prices for everything will rise. Water and food, gas and gasoline. But in 14 years from now, nobody would need water, food, gas, or gasoline, or anything at all. Because after what happens, no later than 2036, no one will need anything.
So what is going to happen on our planet in 2036? We've prepared a detailed model of the events that will take place, and now we're going to present it to you. We consider it our duty to report to you the seriousness of the situation in detail. We know that magmatic activity increases every time there is a cycle, but this time we see that all the processes are more powerful and stronger. This is because this cycle of cataclysms takes place once every 24,000 years, and it is more powerful while the planet's immunity is destroyed by the technological burden of our humanity. It is for this reason, despite the fact that we haven't yet entered the zone of direct action of radiation on the core of our planet, we can already observe an unprecedented growth of cataclysms. We've de deducted the scale of events based on the progression that we have been able to estimate from the increase in the number and strength of earthquakes. Further development of these events leads to the internal cracking of the Earth's crust. Through these cracks, magma will begin to rise in the geometric progression you have seen on the graph. This will then lead to microfractures in the crust in some places, which will increase magmatic activity. And it will keep increasing even more until it provokes a large-scale rupture in the thinnest part of the crust which is in the ocean. This is inevitable. There is a 99.9% .9 probability that this rupture will occur in the area of the Mariana Trench. This is where deep focus earthquakes are registered and where the Earth's crust is the thinnest, only 5 kilometers. At first, when a small amount of water will meet magma, magma will break through the crust for the first time, exploding violently. Then, there will be a series of micro-explosions. We say micro-explosions, although in fact, each of these explosions is equivalent to the explosion of dozens of nuclear bombs. This will destroy the thin layer of crust beneath the Mariana Trench, but the worst will happen next, and to understand what happens next, we will show you an ex experiment. You see what happened when the water met red-hot metal? Now multiply it by a hundred billion times. A gigantic volume of magma from the magma plume will rip the Mariana Trench in an instant, and billions of cubic meters of water will meet billions of cubic meters of magma. Due to the sudden breakdown of oceanic water molecules, oxygen and hydrogen will be released under tremendous pressure at the floor of the Mariana Trench. There will be a huge explosion. This explosion will be the equivalent of thousands of times the entire stockpile of nuclear weapons available on Earth. Under extreme pressure, the ocean won't just boil, it will explode, it will rise a huge column of steam mixed with dust. Under tremendous pressure, this gigantic column of steam will rush so high up that it will tear through our atmosphere. The atmosphere will curl up like a blanket and be blown away by the solar wind. Meaning, our atmosphere will literally be swept away along with the entire water cover. Also, at the same time, this gigantic explosion will cause the powerful hydraulic impact directed inside our planet. Because 11 kilometers of water in the Mariana Trench is an enormous pressure at the point where the explosion will take place. And that pressure will in turn be reflected in the hydraulic impact. There will be a very powerful blast wave directed into the center of the planet into magma, which will spread tangentially, and this will provoke additional cavitation processes. This will lead to an abrupt expansion of magma in all directions by the factor of 10. That is, there will be 10 times more magma. This will literally tear the planet from the inside. With such an impact, magma will behave like a gaseous substance. All volcanoes, cracks, fractures, all boundaries of lithospheric plates will burst and erupt simultaneously. The Earth will be flooded with lava flows, just as it happened on Mars. Naturally, due to the impact, the inner core will bounce away. 
and the motion of the outer core will stop. Our planet will die. This process will take only a few minutes. Due to the stopping of the core, the electromagnetic field of the planet will disappear and the gravitational field will be almost completely gone. Therefore, all satellites will fall from the near-Earth orbit, including the Moon. If the Moon is over the Eastern Hemisphere, it will be thrown away by the explosion and attracted by the Sun. And if the Moon is over the Western Hemisphere, it will fall to Earth the moment the gravitational field is, field is lost. But we humans will no longer be threatened by this, because as a consequence of these events, we as humanity will already cease to extinct completely. What this mathematical model is saying is that if the destruction processes process is slow enough and there are no other factors to trigger its acceleration, then everything we're talking about will happen in October 2036. And that's again provided there are no provoking factors before that. This could be a meteorite fall, a nuclear bomb explosion, an increase in the displacement of the core, or a supervolcano eruption. Right now, the threat of nuclear war is being forced all over the world. With all responsibility, we can say that a nuclear war at this time will accelerate the apocalypse. It will cause irreparable damage, it will kill the economy altogether and contribute to the destabilization of processes within the core, accelerating them. We will just face our doomsday. This is not a solution. This is utter foolishness. We are depriving ourselves of the last time we can do something. Now it's not the time to be divided and fight. It's the time to unite and deal more global issues than ge geopolitical disagreements. We live in a time when the survival of all humanity must take precedence over the private interests of certain countries. Things are much more serious. It's too bad there are still people unaware of this. We're proceeding from what we observe, and the core might swing harder at any moment. This is not an apocalyptic prediction. These are mathematical calculations. This is a mathematical model that takes into account set of all the indicators that we're measuring and observing, including the rate of change in seismic activity, the correlation of escalating disasters, changes in wind, changes in the atmosphere, melting of glaciers from beneath, and deep oceans heating coming from under the seafloor. All this indicates that the destruction of our planet is almost inevitable. Given the fact that no one is addressing this issue, the probability of this scenario is 99.9% .9 based on today's data. Why is it not 100%? Because the only error which could be is that it may happen sooner if some accelerating factors would occur. Anyone who has doubts, please recalculate for yourself. We have no doubts we have already recalculated many times. And God, let us be wrong. We have brought in researchers from every existing scientific field to understand this impact, and we continue to do so. There is not a single science today that can actually observe all the changes that you have learned about today. The science is all divided. Seismologists only deal with earthquakes, Volcanologists only deal with vol volcanoes. Nobody actually knows anything. All science has been reduced to observing facts and conducting mental experiments. To this day, 
we are not even aware of how our planet is structured. But judging from what we see, what we see outside a window, our hypothesis is correct because it precisely fits into the mathematical model. Thanks to mathematics, today we know the truth. It was mathematics that was able to bring all the observations together. And owing to mathematics, we were able to construct a model 10 years ago. Eight years ago, it was published. And now it is fully verified by the current events. Unfortunately, it is confirmed every day that this is not a hypothesis. These are facts. But we wish it were some other way. But you can't argue against math. And unlike the anthropogenic model of climate change that they are trying to impose on us, we're telling the truth about what is happening to the climate. And no one has neither arguments nor evidence against those facts. Our arguments are right outside the window. The model we're talking about is real. That's why we act. Aren't you afraid? Then you are either a very brave person or a fool or suicidal. Only a person who is suicidal is not afraid, but a normal person is. We would be the first to rejoice if we are wrong. But unfortunately, the further we studied the question, the more we became convinced of the inevitability of the catastrophe. And the more we were thinking about how to stop it, We've been looking for a solution and we found it. Based on the fact that the same climate changes are taking place on other planets of the solar system and even on the sun itself, we understand that this is an external influence. This is a certain cosmic radiation and every 24,000 years it has a stronger impact on our planet. It is this radiation that sets the cycle of cataclysms and affects planets, including our own. What is this radiation? To date, we know that the energy that affects our planet and leads to the destabilization of its core is similar to the kind of energy which allows the entangled particles to communicate with each other even when they are at different ends of the galaxy. This kind of energy has not been studied, but we do know that it is not a neutrino or electromagnetic effect, it is something different. Today, as humanity, we already know that quantum communication through interstellar space is possible. We already understand and know a lot, but it's not enough. Therefore, in order to counteract this cosmic impact, on our planet, we need to counteract it with an equal force of the same energy. But in order to do this, we need to find this energy, study it and learn how to use it at least at the same in the same way as we use electricity. After all, today no one knows what electricity is, but yet we use it. The planet is affected by a high energy impact of enormous power. It's capable of shifting the planet's core and causing changes in, in the microcosm. This force is still beyond our scientific understanding. However, we did encounter forces that we had never understood before, for example, radio waves. It's it's like sending our modern, modern iPhone 300 years back in time. Would people who lived then be able to make a call within it? No, no one would, because they simply wouldn't have known how to use it. If they were said that they can use the radio waves to communicate, at the same level of development we are, and now we need to study this invisible force which is affecting our planet. Yes, we have a general understanding of the processes, but yet it's too much scientific work to be done. We need a single intellectual fist with which in 
which will include the best minds of humanity, not pseudoscientists or grant eaters, but true scientists. Unfortunately, in our current consumer's format, it is impossible to do this because all the best scientists of the world are hidden from us in the secret laboratories and design bureaus. They are mainly engaged in developing weapons. And in today's realities, not a single state will let them out or allow them to unite because the highest priority now is to preserve power, not human lives. That is why we need to change the format of existing system. We need the creative society. This is our only chance. Thank you so much for your attention. This information is very shocking. And the worst thing is that only a few people know about this. So now the question is, what should we do? Let's start from the beginning. Until now, humanity has never faced such a problem and we need to find a solution. The year 2036 is the year of our end. If nothing changes, we have only five to six relatively stable years to do everything possible and impossible to counteract the radiation that is coming to Earth and causing this catastrophic destruction. It is a matter of survival of each and every one of us. Climatic cataclysms are gaining momentum, and as of today, the scientific world has not put forward a single working model to solve this vital issue. The scientists we know about from the media will not help us find a solution. These are the people who care about grants and titles, not the truth. One striking example is despite the fact that climate change is already apparent to everyone, 12,000 such scientists sign off on the fact that the climate is not changing. Why are they doing this? They either get paid to do it or do it for career advancements. Can such scientists give us a real solution? Of course not. Today, all that official science does is fight for more prestigious cabins on a sinking ship. We are not satisfied with that. We want to save the whole ship because we're all sailing on it together. And it is already sinking. We need real scientists who know how to protect the ship. We need scientists with the practical experience and the actual knowledge required to solve this problem. Where are these scientists? It is no secret that humanity's best minds are now engaged in the military sector. They possess applied knowledge and practical experience. They are those who in closed laboratories develop new technologies that are now, unfortunately, being used against humanity. Governments hide these scientists in secret design bureaus. Today, it is not beneficial for any state to show those real thinkers. Why not? The current consumerist format is dominated by politics in which everyone is each other's enemy, where the race for power and dominance comes first. So countries will continue to hide and use these scientists to guarantee their security. But what they don't yet realize is that right now we have one common enemy, the climate. There is no point in inventing a weapon that will kill us all because we are all on the verge of being killed by the climate. We have five or six years left to make a leap in developing new science. To do this, we must bring together true scientists and all our intellectual and material resources into one single goal. This goal is to study the radiation affecting our planet from space and find how to counter it. Yes, it's great that today there is already community of scientists who understand the real cause of climate change. Today, you and I heard the report from this international scientific community that has been doing many scientific studies over the years to find a solution. But as we understand, these scientists are not enough. They cannot do it on their own. We need to free all the best scientists in the world from closed laboratories, bring them together around one table and give them the goal to find a solution to save us all. But 
Is this realistic in today's format of society? No, it is not. Because right now, the power of the few prevails over the billions, and they will fight for it to the end. So no state will give up their best scientists. It's impossible to bring together specialists from competing classified laboratories. What is the solution? We need to ensure that these scientists don't have to develop weapons and that countries don't have to defend themselves. That is simply impossible in our consumerist format of society. So the only way to free these scientists is to change the existing model of the social organization of our society to a model where wars will be impossible and will be eliminated. Scientists worldwide would then have the opportunity to devote their full attention to solving the global climate threat. And that must be accomplished as soon as possible because time is running out. Ten years ago, when the situation with the climate and its progression became apparent to us, we started developing such a new model. Since this model implements global changes worldwide, it must consider all the factors that ensure the safety of society in an integrated way. We studied the world's historical experience to account for all of humanity's mistakes. The main thing we understood is that the new model of society should meet the needs of all people. After all, we as humanity have already fought enough and gone through economic crisis, famines, and wars. And all this has been repeated in a vicious cycle for thousands of years. Therefore, if we change the format of society, it must be a radical change and one that will provide the best living conditions for all people. Throughout the past 10 years, we, together with volunteers and experts from over the, all over the world, have conducted extensive analytical work and numerous social surveys worldwide. We surveyed millions of people in over 180 countries, conducted interviews and consultations, and held international roundtables and conferences with experts in various fields. By studying and analyzing the needs of people around the world, we've been able to create a working model that transforms every aspect of society. And most importantly, it ensures that scientists can come together to solve the climate problem as quick as possible. Because on a comprehensive analysis of the will of people, the eight pillars that make this model work were formed. They embody what all people want. We have called this model the creative society. Further on, we will be using this term, but it can be called differently. It is not the name, but the essence of this model, which will help us cope with global climate disasters. Let's take a closer look at this model and see what its fundamental difference from the current format of society is. First, in the creative society, the priority of everything is life, not profit. Second, power will belong to the people and will not be concentrated in the hands of a single person or a separate group of people as it is today. The creative society is a format in which the life, freedom, security, and well-being of each person is of the highest value not on paper, but in deeds. A society where there is no power of one person over another, where people make decisions on key issues together without shifting responsibility to a small group. Bodies of public self-government become coordination executive groups of specialists, which under constant public monitoring, People have all the tools to recall and control the people taking part in these groups because their activities must be aimed exclusively at the benefit of humanity. In this model of society, human birthright owns all resources, water, gas, oil, electricity, natural resources, all of it is owned by human beings. 
This format eliminates the possibility of usurpation of resources in one set of hands, and hence the dominance of one person or group of people over the majority. And all this is guaranteed by the fact that the eight pillars of the creative society, which you see now on the screen, become the basis of the constitution of all countries. This makes it possible to reformat the value base of world society from anti-human to human and to make human life the highest value in a peaceful and legislative way. Now, I want to emphasize that the creative society cannot be, can only be built peacefully with the support of all people. For that to happen, all people must be aware of this model. The creative society will ensure a world free of poverty, crime, and violence. It will give us a safe, comfortable life anywhere in the world. Stability and confidence in our future and that of our children. The ability to develop our business in a sustainable and predictable economy. We will be able to implement technologies that are withheld from use in the current consumer format. Moreover, it will give humanity access to new ways of generating energy. It will accelerate our development as one unified civilization. Such a society is beneficial to all. But most importantly, it gives us a chance to survive because the creative society is the complete absence of wars. And this means that real scientists will be able to find freedom to unite their intellectual potential. Then they can work together to find a way to counteract the cosmic radiation affecting our planet, which in turn will stop the destabilization of our core and the boiling of magma. The mathematical model that you and I have heard today clearly states that if we do nothing, 2036 will be the end of us. We wish this model was wrong, but unfortunately, it is true. You can do the math to verify it. But don't just cite paid scientists who defend false hypotheses about climate change to the last minute, thereby wasting our money and precious time. That makes what makes a real scientist different is that he changes his views if he sees new circumstances and facts. He does not ignore them. He accepts them. We no longer have time to ignore reality. We only have six relatively stable years until the bifurcation point. Six years while well, we can still do something, save ourselves, our families, and our friends. And we understand very well why the heads of state keep quiet about this, because they're afraid that the people will become unmanageable, driven by panic. Moreover, they simply don't know what to do, but we do. That's why we are here today presenting this information, because we know that together we can make the necessary change in our world and survive if we really want to. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. And thank you to all of our esteemed speakers and scientists. Indeed, today we are talking about the issue of everyone's survival. It is no longer a question of conflicts and war. The threats is hanging over everybody, over everyone. Any war, if you want it, can be stopped. But we will be unable to stop what is happening now with the climate unless we build a new model of a society and find a way out of climatic collapse very quickly. We now see that the model of a creative society gives us a real chance. What is also important is that this model provides a solution to all modern crises and allows us to form a beautiful society, a life that everyone deserves. It will be a beautiful world full of opportunities for everyone, including entrepreneurs. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sima Mandral Negi, Director, Principal, Sanjivani World School life and happiness coach 
She is the vice president of Rotary Club of Mumbai West Coast and social ambassador of India Development Foundation, as well as an awardee of the Nation Builder Award from Rotary. Dr. Nege is associated with many educational and social organizations and contributes her time and efforts for the betterment of the educational system and society. She is an international speaker and is highly regarded in seven countries. Dr. Nege has been bestowed with many prestigious national and international awards. Her work has been recognized in the World Book of Records UK. Asian World Records, and the Great Indian Book of Records in personal and professional categories. Welcome, Dr. Negi. The floor is yours. Hello, dear friends. I want to be honest with you. I'm just shocked by the information about the climate we have heard today and what awaits us in 2036. I work with children and it breaks my heart to realize that many of them will not live until their adulthood. We only have five, six years to change this catastrophic situation and we are obliged to do our best. And I see that to achieve this as soon as possible, there is a lot that we Rotarians can do. In the model of creative society, I see a real change for the survival of humanity. And if you look at it in economic terms, it is primarily beneficial for business because it ensures the absence of inflation or any crisis and provides the opportunity for stable and predictable development of the economy and business. The creative society implies market and healthy competition, access to all new technologies, absence of corruption and political influence on the economy and business, predictable demand, affordable, no interest loan for businesses, no duty fees, lower tax burden on big businesses and no taxes for small and medium-sized businesses. We'll be able to make this happen because we, businessmen and economists, will play a key role and will be directly involved in developing this new global economic model. It is not, politi it is not politicians, but experts and business people who are supposed to write new laws. Business should not depend on politics because businessmen bring great efficiency to society. And the ones who feed and provide must be the one to write new laws. It shouldn't be decided for us, but it is us who must decide. We will no longer play to someone else's tune because we are practitioners. We know all the problems of business and the economy from the inside. We will be able to create a society that even science fiction writers couldn't think of when describing the most beautiful worlds. And what is also important to note, the model of the creative society implies exclusively peaceful implementation with a comfortable transition from period for the effective restart of global economic, financial and social processes. All legal, economic and social mechanisms for a peaceful, democratic transition exist today in all democratic countries. They must have to be used properly. The transition period from the current format to the creative one will be gradual and soft. Already at this stage, we need of the need of each person should be satisfied at a decent level of universal basic income. This will create solvent demand and stimulate the development of enterprises and industries, as well as the rapid growth of the economy. I appeal 
to your vast experience and unique knowledge look at this model through the prism of your experience your business and your career if you have questions and suggestions let's discuss them personally i see this model as the real and only chance as rotarians we see and understand for ourselves how deficient our current format is we do our best to fix it in order to improve the life of society but it is still bursting at the seams at the seams if it were not for rotary's contribution many people would have had a much harder time as of today but now we face an even more global problem and we have a great chance to change everything dear rotarians let's take this chance and unite all our efforts i believe it is important now to support the building of the creative society if we are already taking this step to restart our global world order then let's do it in such a way that our world becomes a paradise let's make a world where there will be no lies no manipulations where we are secure and happy and most importantly a world where you and i and our children have a future thank you Thank you very much Dr. Negi. Indeed, the new model of the creative society opens up great prospects for everyone. And most important, it is in this format that we will be able to confront global climate change. Many leading economists are searching for a solution to shape the economy and save the humanity from a global economic crisis. And now, with the great honor, we want to introduce you to a man who has dedicated his life to finding a way out of the ongoing economic crisis and bringing businesses together to build a better world many of you know him already dr itzhak calderon adizes he is the world's leading management expert founder and ceo of the adizes institute one of the top 10 consulting companies in the world The Adidas Institute implements programs for a wide variety of companies ranging from startups to members of the Fortune 100. Dr. Adidas has advised United States presidents, prime ministers, and cabinet level officers across the world. In recognition of his contribution to management theory and practice, Dr. Adidas has received 21 honorary doctorates from university in 11 countries. He is an international best-selling author. He has published more than 26 books which have been translated into 36 languages. His book Corporate Life Cycle: How and Why Corporations Grow and Die and What to Do About It was named one of the 10 best business books by Library Journal. Dr. Adizes recently completed two books about his personal story and the experience that made him the man he has become. They are the books The Accordion Player and What Matters in Life: Lessons I Learned from Opening My Heart. Many successful business people and managers have been raised on Dr. Adizes' books. He has devoted more than 40 years of his life to developing and implementing the concept of business which leads to exceptional results in changing and management based on integration unification and management from the heart with a deep respect we give the floor to dr adizes Hello. It's a big privilege for me to have this opportunity to speak to you such a distinguished group of people from Rotary International and introducing you to Creative Society, a network of young people 
with incredible energy and desire to make a difference in this world. So we, they, and future generations can actually survive. I was asked by Creative Society to say a few words how I see the future of humanity and what will be the role of leadership and management in choosing the right route. To make a long story, very complicated story short, it is how I see it. If you look at development of humanity of the chimpanzees, if you are Darwinian, till today, we see the following pattern. The strongest chimpanzee was a leader. Then we became a nomadic society and the strongest hunter was the leader. Then we became an agricultural society and the person with the most land, sheep and cows was the leader. What's the common denominator to these three periods? Muscles, possession, strength, power. And that, by the way, is under platform of colonialism. The more land, the more assets, the stronger you are. Then came the industrial society, and now the brain got into the game. Now we had to plan and organize and hire and fire and budget and think. Not only power, the brain came to the power. Now we live in what's called the post-industrial society. And what is it? Mostly brain. Brain is the secret of success. As we know, some of the most valuable companies in the stock market have very few assets if any. What does Uber have? Not even one taxi. They have a computer, information. What does Airbnb, the largest hotel in the world, have? Not one hotel. Computer, information. What does Google and Facebook and LinkedIn, all of them collect? Data. Data. Brain. Brain is a source of power now. But that is on its way out too. With artificial intelligence, with quantum computers, we'll use computers and robotics to do what our brain is doing. So what's the future? The heart. The heart cannot be replaced. Muscles can be replaced. The brain can be replaced with a chip. Heart cannot be replaced. If we do not develop the heart and we remain with muscles and brain, we'll be repeating Nazi Germany. Highly educated people, music, art, literature, brain, power, no heart. So unless we develop heart, and that means consciousness, conscience, values, integration. Our future is not going to be different from Nazi Germany. More and more powerful hydrogen bombs, nuclear bombs, no heart. But we need to develop leadership that works with the heart. Unfortunately, our education is based on to know more, to know more, to know more, to know more. We have to start thinking how we develop people that not only think, but feel, who has a system of values that drives towards integration and not disintegration. Because we live in a time of accelerated change and change causes disintegration. And what is the solution to problems of disintegration? Integration. And what is integration? 
working with the heart. I hope this insight is the beginning of a conversation that we could have in the future. How to do that? I can give a bottom line of what I've developed for 50 years and my institute practices worldwide in 52 countries. So it's not an empty word, manage with the heart. What is managing with the heart? Integration. What is love, if not absolute integration? Well, how do you operationalize it? Not to talk about love, integration. There are empty words unless we can operationalize it in real life. How do we do that? Mutual trust and respect. When there is mutual trust and respect, which is the beginning of love, you cannot have love without mutual trust and respect. How can you love somebody you know respect and don't trust? So the way we integrate companies, and I work with prime ministers, eight of them around the world, is how do we integrate society? Is by building a culture of mutual trust and respect, which is what made America the success it is. It's not his size, it's not his national resources, other have it. It's a culture of live and let live. Respect for diversity and integration of common interest. The division, diversity, integrated. Integrated diversity, integrated by common purpose, by common interest. What my clients call it in Mexico, prosperidad incluyente, inclusive prosperity. And that's what needs to be done. That's how we operationalize to make survival of this society and the world that is falling apart. Respecting our environment, respecting each other's differences, trusting because develop by developing common interests, working for the common good. And that should be the driving force for the future if we are going to survive. Thank you. Dear Dr. Adizis, on behalf of all Rotarians, we thank you for your contribution to today's event and your contribution to our future. And the esteemed Dr. Adizis wisely said, we need management from the heart. Unfortunately, this is impossible in our current consumer format, where the main priority is muscle and force, that is power. Uniting people in this format is impossible because countries will fight each other to the end, defending their interest. In the consumerist format, all attempt to survive will boil down to waging new wars and the violent conquest of another countries. But that is not an acceptable solution. In any case, all selfish interests will soon disappear. But the question is, Will they disappear and we will stay, or will they disappear along with us? You and I have heard fact-based prognosis today, and we understand what awaits us. But there is another option to start with a clean slate for the whole world. And as Dr. Adiza said, to build a society of mutual trust and respect, where the way of the heart, the way of humanity prevails. Because we are human beings and we all want to live and we can rely only on each other. Thank you very much. Indeed, our strength is in unity because only by joining forces can we change the format of society. And to do this, all people must learn as quickly as possible about what is really happening with the climate today and what is in store for us in the near future. We need to accelerate the process of dissemination of information and we need to do it urgently. There are 8 billion people on the planet their lives are at risk. But at the same time, they are the ones who can change everything, but they don't even know that. And they're all need to learn and know about this. 
How can this be done? What can each of us do right now? Right now, this information is close to majority. But on November 12th, it will be made public on November 12th, an open international online forum will be held. Global crisis, our survival is in unity, which will be simultaneously interpreted into 150 languages of the world. The purpose of this forum is to inform all of humanity about what is really happening to the planet's climate and what is the solution. All of humanity must learn what you have learned today. The upcoming forum on November 12th is critical in informing people. A great deal depends on it today. Given the way climatic events are unfolding, we have less and less time to inform mankind and therefore less time to take action. Unfortunately, we, the participants of the Creative Society Project, have no access to central media. We act and inform according to our capabilities solely on a volunteer basis. So please join us. This affects everyone. It is our common cause. Suggest and implement all your ideas on how to make the broadcast of the forum in 150 languages available for the whole of humanity to watch. We have one month to do this. If you can, please get the media involved to broadcast this forum on television, on various websites, on personal, and any platform you can find on the internet. This is the most important thing that can be done at this point. On the screen, you can see the details of who to contact regarding the distribution of the forum. We would also like to remind you that you will be able to access today's report using the same link you're using right now. And everyone registered for today's event will receive a video recording of this report. A lot depends on each of you right now. You are already in possession of life-changing information that leads to choices. So what will you choose? You can go to your companies, look at what you've built and answer yourself. Are you ready to lose it all in 14 years? You can come home, look into the eyes of your children, and your loved ones and answer yourself. Are you ready to lose them in 14 years? Are you ready to accept the fact that in 14 years, neither you nor they will exist anymore? And you, your inaction, your lack of understanding and your unwillingness to act will be the cause. Your unwillingness to make an effort and act. Or will you act, thereby leaving them a legacy, leaving them life, leaving them a different, beautiful world? The choice is yours. Can I add something from the bottom of my heart? Dear Rotarians, everyone who truly cares about humanity, the most important thing we can do is to inform every single person on this planet about the upcoming forum. That is our mutual task. After all, who else but Rotary can be the main guarantor of the survival of the human civilization? What is needed today is the unification of the humankind. It may seem easy enough to unite, but is it so? For example, the Rotary Club is one big family of fellowship, of like-minded people, all as one. And what could be easier than to unite all Rotarians? But in practice, it turned out to be different. Despite the efforts of so many people, we couldn't bring everyone together. Not all Rotarians are with us today. Despite the gravity of the situation, they ignored the most important event to date. And this isn't easy to admit. 
where where are these rotarians when the situation on the planet is so dire where are they at this moment when humanity really needs them why aren't they with us if we couldn't unite rotarians imagine what we have to do to unite all the people on the planet and we need to unite all human kind in a very short time because only then we will have a chance thank you thank you very much dr negi i totally agree with you that rotary is one big friendly family and i'm confident that together we can not only save this world but make it an eden Dear friends, our meeting today is coming to a close and our technical support team informs me that we already have questions coming in from, in from the audience. We don't have much time left, unfortunately, and I hope we can answer some of them at least. But before we get to the Q&A part, on behalf of the Rotaract Atlanta Metro, I would like to express a sincere gratitude to all our speakers who have presented today. Dear Rotarians from around the world, thank you for being with us today, despite the time difference. And the reason this report was presented to you is because thanks to your persistence, thanks to your dedication to helping the entire humanity, this vital information is certain to gain momentum and soon everyone will be aware of not only the problem that we have right now, but also the solution. We know that you will not remain indifferent to the information presented because you know that each day that passes without action results in death of a great number of people. Now I would like to open the floor to the questions. Please. Connect Zoom via the link on our homepage, and we will answer the question in the order received. I would like to uh, ask our technical support to invite our first participant in Q&A section and to ask his or her question. Thank you for giving me the word. Good evening, everyone. The question is the following. When all people are informed about the climate, what's next? You are saying that everyone must be introduced and informed. So we've informed everyone. Everyone has heard about the problem on the forum, and the whole world has learned about the solution. What's next? Uh, what will happen next? A revolution or what? Uh, thank you very much for your question. May I answer this one? Um, no, the creative society cannot be built on revolutions, on human blood or illegal actions. Everything must be legal, peaceful, and according to people's will. And people themselves must choose whether to live or to die. The building of the creative society implies a transitional stage for a comfortable and gradual restart of global economic, financial, and social processes. Um, this stage should be handled by specialists. Uh, the first stage of building the creative society where we are now is the hardest and the most difficult stage, which is informing all people so that they themselves could decide whether they support this format. And then afterwards, everything is easy and simple. And most importantly, it's absolutely honest. In other words, a common electoral demand must be formed to build the creative society. First, at the level of the country, through elections or referendums, people vote only for those politicians who support the creative society. In that case, people use their own power for their own survival. Next, there is a worldwide referendum on the adoption of the creative society model. And preparations are made for the unification of countries. 
And there are examples of this, such as the European Union or another form of unification. It doesn't matter. But the point is that we become a united humanity, a single civilization. There will be no government. There will be one government. But that one government is all of humanity. So that never again will anyone deceive us, walk over us, manipulate us, or kill us. When the world government is all of humanity, then each person's life will be valued as one's own. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you so much, Olga, for answering this question. And technical support, we are ready for the next one. Hello, and uh, thank you so much for all details you have told us about the climate. I'm from Pakistan and my country has experienced a real horror this year, a huge flood. I can confirm that climate collapse, it is not somewhere, it is already happening. It's chaos. It should not go on like this. It needs to be solved. And thank you for your report and your work. In the climatic part of your report, you have mentioned a parallel about the Earth and the Mars. You said that the Earth would become like Mars. What does it have to do with Earth and the Mars? Why you make such parallel? Thank you. Uh, may I answer this question? Thank you so much for being with us here today, and I hope that we will come together and do our best to make sure that disasters like the one in Pakistan don't happen again. And thank you so much for your question. You asked why we're drawing parallels with Mars. The thing is that according to remote sensing studies, there used to be rivers, seas, and a very dense atmosphere on Mars. The red color of rocks on Mars indicates this. The surface of Mars consists mostly of basalt, which is usually black. But on Mars, basalt um, are covered with iron oxide, in other words, rust, which is what gives the planet its characteristic red hue. There had to be a very dense oxygenated atmosphere to oxidize that much basaltic lava, but now it's gone. Have you ever thought why the entire planet is covered in oxidized basaltic lava? Why were there so many eruptions? Mars is a planet that perished during a cycle of cataclysms. Now it has virtually no magnetic field and a very weak gravitational field, while the atmosphere was blown away by the solar wind. And as you already understand, the core of Mars is practically not functioning now. There was a hydraulic impact inside the planet, and when volatile gases were escaping the magma during eruptions, they oxidized metals in the basalts. Now we realize that the processes taking place on Earth are the same as there were on Mars, because of the processes in the Earth's core, the, its displacement and destabilization, the planet's rotation is accelerating, while increasing, which increases the centrifugal force. This pushes magma from the depths closer to the crust, and magma starts boiling during its ascent. Cavitation explosions build up in it, magma increases in volume and presses harder on the Earth's crust. The crust begins to crack and heat up while magma erodes and thins it out, and Siberia is a very good example of this. The temperature there rises three to, time, to four times faster than in the rest of the world. In Siberia, the permafrost is melting from below and water is boiling in wells. Meanwhile, the, the fires started breaking out from under the snow in the Arctic. And, you know, there is no other team in the world that would look at the climate problem so comprehensively from all angles as we have been doing for a long time. Eight years ago, we published a short report with a prediction of the events, and now the prediction is coming true completely. Unfortunately, everything confirms our mathematical model. Double-check this information, and you will get the same results as we did. 
and we analyzed it very comprehensively and we would be more than happy if somebody disapproved our model we would be happy because we are not interested in our model becoming true we are sane people the anthropogenic model gives a false hope that something can be changed and sooner than 50 years but we are just wasting time while the CO2 based model has absolutely nothing to do with reality. CO2 will increase anyway as a result of magma ascent. You understand that, right? So, you know, I absolutely cannot understand why scientists didn't see this and why. Uh, they only talk about CO2. The only explanation is either they've been t bought to trade CO2 quotas or they're actually really afraid because they don't see any solutions. But we do have a solution. We already have some groundwork, we have the understanding, but we won't be able to stop the destabilization of the core on our own. We need a huge number of smart people to deal with this challenge. If we had even a slightest doubt that it is possible, we would be living this life differently now. We would enjoy every sunset and sunrise, every breath. We would be with our loved ones right now every second. But we are confident that there is a way out. Throughout this time, we've been actively trying to reach out to humanity, but we're faced with a huge inertia among people. You know, I never would have thought it would be so hard to save humanity. We encounter a huge number of inert people. They don't know how much time is left and so they are so not in a hurry. That's why it's so crucial to get the information about progression of all these processes to every person on the planet. This is why this is the, the only way. Otherwise, this simply will not have time to do anything. And this is why the Creative Society project was initiated two and a half years ago to convey this information to people. However, it's impossible to reach billions without the help of mass media. That's why we appeal to all people who want to leave, who want their grandchildren and great-grandchildren to leave. We cannot stop the climate process ourselves, and we cannot reach out to everyone either. There is no point in relying on politicians to agree or and do something. We need to act now. We need people to start talking about it themselves. We have a chance to leave a planet as a dead Mars, but we also have a chance to preserve the planet. Do you know what really concerns me? It's the Mariana Trench. Remember, we earlier said that there is a forecast of a magnitude 10 earthquake near the Mariana Trench. Several independent groups of seismologists have given this forecast that the Nankai Tough throw, sorry, in Japan will experience this earthquake in the next 5-10 years. This is scary not only because it threatens to kill 140 million people living in the Japanese archipelago, it's much more dangerous than that. It's so frightening because the Nankai Top is located on the same single fold with the Mariana Trench. And along this fold, there are more deep focus earthquakes, which we already know are cavitation explosions. And the most intense seismic activity is now occurring in the Mariana Trench itself. In 2017, there were more than 2,000 earthquakes in the Mariana Trench within half a year. After this, the information about sism seismicity there was covered up. These earthquakes indicate that microfractures are actively forming there now, meaning that the magma, by making its way through, forms a tremendous number of fractures. And with each earthquake, there are more and more new fractures formed, which bring closer the contact of 11 kilometers of ocean water with magma. Already now, the water at the bottom of the Mariana Trench is heating up. The temperature at the bottom reaches four degrees Celsius, while the average temperature of the ocean depth is just above zero. Guess why the ocean temperature at the bottom of the Mariana Trench is rising and seismic activity is increasing? That's right, because the magma is sent. The magma chamber has been there for a long time, but the growth of seismic activity suggests that magma is expanding. As we already understand, 
Swede, uh, Taiwan Peninsula and everywhere else the problems begin to arise as well. And right now, as we speak, the oceanic water is making its way to magma along the new fractures that are formed as a result of earthquakes there. This is a fairly rapid process. And today, we as humankind are unable to stop this process. This is a fact that we've been living with for more than 10 years. And starting today, you will have to live with it too. Because now, you also understand that this is really an apocalyptic doomsday bomb with a clockwork mechanism. Every second of our inaction diminishes our chances for salvation. And as we said, according to our mathematical calculations, the Mariana Trench will explode in October 2036, plus or minus one month. And after October 2036, our Earth will become very similar to Mars. For this very reason, we compared Mars to Earth. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for your answer and expanding our topic of the day. But unfortunately, the time of our meeting is coming to an end. But I see that among the frequently asked questions is the question, what Rotary can do? And I will allow myself to answer with the words of our distinguished speakers. Global problems require global solution. Who, if not Rotary, will be able to do it now? And as a Rotarian, I can say with the confidence that you and I must do everything possible to save all of humanity. We must lead this project, make it the most important project of our organization, and spread information about the forum in as many ways as possible, which will be held on November 12th. Its name was not chosen by chance. Indeed, our survival is only in unity, and we are the ones who will be able to unite all of humanity. Thank you again for your time and attention. And we will be able to happy to answer all of your remaining questions. Please send them to one of the emails you see on the screen right now. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the sponsors who helped with the invitation of fellow Rotarians. Thank you again for all your help and service to humanity. We had thousands of Rotarians from all over the world with us today. And now I would like to give the floor to the president of sponsoring club, Emory Druid Hills, Manoj Barrett, for finishing words. Dear Rotarians and Rotractors, on behalf of the Emory Druid Hills Rotary Sponsored Club for Rotract Atlanta Metro, I want to thank you all for attending this event. The facts we heard today are critical to understanding the gravity of the situation in which the whole world finds itself. We are faced with a global threat. The future of humanity depends on us. Let us remember once again our motto, which is service above self. And now is the best time to understand these words depth and apply ourselves accordingly. The world needs the best of the best Rotarians. We need real heroes not Hollywood characters. And thank God we Rotarians have each other. For in reality, Rotary is the consolidation of the best of the best people. And our role in the destiny of humanity is the greatest, which is to save the world. Our meeting today is not an accident. It is a chance for all the people of the planet. It is our duty and no one will save this planet but us. Thank you.